The Phoenix Build by Aldmar. Hi everyone, Alvar here. Welcome to my Phoenix build. This build will help you rejuvenate, recover, and easily maintain your progress during the leveling and endgame. This build has solid healing and solid DPS, and it is perfect for anyone trying to do new unknown content or perhaps step into higher difficulties. If you're looking for low risk, high reward gameplay, this is the build for you. For now, I'm gonna hand it over to Warjack to kick off the leveling process. Enjoy. Hi everyone, Warjack here. Start off at level one as a human cleric. My stat points are spent 10 for strength, 15 for dexterity, 16 con, and 18 wisdom. Feats are two weapon fighting, follow of the sovereign host, and quicken spell. Skills, I put my one mandatory point into perform, tumble, and use magical device. After that, I max out concentration. Here's what my character looks like. Make sure the alignment is lawful. I took lawful good. At level 1 we get Cure Light Wounds, Night Shield, and Bless. For our enhancements, we're going to go into the Falconary Tree and take Healing Amplification. If you've got any racial points, you spend them on some Action Boost and more Healing Amplification. Just a quick note, I'm doing this recording while I'm already at level 30. So, while you see me in a level 1 area, if the attack and damage doesn't seem to be aligned, or the hit points seem to be too much, well, yeah, I just, it's very important to keep this in context. For the gameplay, simply use Night Shield to protect against magic missiles and Bless to help you with the attack penalty from your two weapon fighting. And then just walk up the things and attack them. If you take any damage, heal up. And if you have a action boost, well, use it when you fight a boss. Level two is Cleric. I will be auto granted Trip and Sunder as martial feats, and that is because for my Cleric Domain, I took Domain of War. For my skill points, I max out Concentration. For our enhancement points, we'll be spending one point on confirming critical hits, and other three on my Sprint Boost. Domain of War gives you access to Trip and Sunder, so I'll put these on your action bar. Also, Domain of War makes your turn undead act as a 20 second buff to melee and ranged power. So put that on your shortcut bar also. The extra spell I get is Divine Favor, who further increases my attack bonus. So you buff up, hit your boosts for your turn undead, and kill everything. Level three is Cleric. I'll be taking Weapon Focus Slashing, which includes Weapon Focus Slashing Long Swords, and for my skills, I'll be maxing out Concentration and then putting all the rest into Heal. If you look closely at your weapon, you can see that it says that the attack and damage modifiers are based off Strength. So, for my enhancements, I'm going to spend 2 points for another point of Wisdom and the other 2 points on Deadly Instinct 2. Now, if you look at my weapon modifier, it says that it's based off Strength or Wisdom. This is a wisdom based character and i'm going to be using wisdom for attack and damage for my second level spells i'll be getting in cure moderate wounds i'll be putting this as my main healing spell making sure that it is always quickened 
but I'll also leave a secondary version for my backup spell without the quicken. Resist energy, I'll be taking, opening it up, and dragging all five versions onto my shortcut bars. And I'll be taking restoration, just in case I'd have any stat damage. At level three, you just buff up once you step into the quest. You can use your sprint boost to run around. You use your turn undead buff when you face off against bosses and heal up if you need it. Level four is monk. My ability point will be spent in wisdom. I will be auto granted proficiency with hand traps and shuriken. I will be getting the four monk elemental stance and level one elemental attacks. Also, all of the finishing moves. For my feet, I will be taking Whirling Steel Strikes, which allows monks to use long swords while being centered. For my skills, I first max out concentration, and then put all the rest into jump. At level 4, I'll be spending my enhancement points in the Shintao Monk Tree for another 10% offhand strike chance while centered. In the Feats tab, I'll be pulling all of my Monk Elemental Strikes and Elemental Stance and putting them on my shortcut bars. This build uses Ocean Stance for extra wisdom and defense. Make sure it's easily accessed to be quickly reapplied if you become uncentered. The Monk finishing moves work as follows. After executing three Monk attacks, in this case Triple Fire, my character will glow white. Then I can press on the finishing move icon and execute the appropriate finishing move. Level 5 is Monk. I'll be auto granted evasion and meditation. For my Monk bonus feat, I'll be taking precision, which adds to my attack chance and my chance to bypass enemy fortification. For my skills, I max out concentration and then put all the rest into jump. I'll be spending two of my enhancement points in the falconary tree for another 5% to my total hit points, and another two points in the Vistani knife fighter tree. I'll be taking precision, putting it on my action bar and activating it. This will stay active for the rest of the game. And meditation can be used if you happen to be really low on key and would like to regenerate it. Note that it takes a bit of time, so this is not useful mid-fight. Now that I have evasion, when I succeed at making my reflex save, I now take no damage rather than half damage. Level 6 is Monk. I'll be auto-granted Still Mind, who adds to my saves versus enchantments, and some extra movement speed while centered. I'll also be getting a whole bunch of new finishing moves. They will all be activated because I have a new feat called Fists of Light, or Light Monk, as my feat. Also, I'll be taking a Knight's Training that increases my critical multiplier on long swords by one. For my skills, I'll be maxing out concentration, then jump, and whatever I've got left, I'll be dumping in diplomacy. I'll be spending my action points on Mist Stalker, which gives me 25% negative energy absorption and some MRR and PRR, and then one point on my action boost haste. I'll be dragging it to my shortcut bar along with the monk attack fists of light to go together with all of my other elemental attacks. The positive water combo is water, positive, water. And your finishing move will give you a one minute AOE buff that gives you a 25% discount to all spells. So now you'll be using this every time at the beginning of a quest before you buff up. The air positive finishing move gives you 20% blur. This doesn't stack with regular blur. So if you don't have a blur item, this is very useful. If you do, well, this is useless. Here you can see when I'm about to sell this item, it has a price. Using the positive fire finishing move, I get a boost to all skills, including my Haggle. This also gives you a boost to attack and damage and stuff. The earth positive finishing move will give you protection against stun and some other negative effects. 
my action boost will be used to speed up my attack speed. Anytime you use the positive attack, it will mark a target so that when you attack it, you will gain back health every time you hit it. At this level, we are auto granted defeat slow fall. It is meant to be always active unless you turn it off by clicking on it. As far as I can tell, it doesn't really make a difference. I'm not sure what's up with this. It might be bugged. 7. Cleric. I'll be maxing out my concentration and putting all the rest into heal. I'll be spending my action points on fully upgrading my haste boost and also the two points in tear flesh, even though I'm not using it right now. You'll notice when I click on my action boost, you'll see that it says that my bonus to melee speed is 10%, even though I've already purchased the 30%. That is because it will not use the 30% version until you redrag it from your enhancements tab and put it on your action bar. Now that I have the newer version dragged to my action bar, when I click it, it says 30% as you would expect. For my spells, I now have aid for some extra temporary hit points and protection from evil for some extra defense. I make sure to use the positive ocean finishing move before buffing and then using my turn undead buff together with my haste boost and attacking. Level 8 is Cleric. My ability point will be spent in Wisdom and I will be granted Improved Domain of War which now gives me proficiency with all weapons and exotic weapons. This doesn't change much for me since I will still probably become uncentered if I changed weapons. For my skills, I'll be maxing out concentration and then heal. I'll be spending my enhancement points on Falconary Core Tier 3 and plus 3 to my Assassinate DCs. For spells, I now upgrade my primary to Cure Serious Wounds and make sure it's always quickened. And my secondary is Cure Moderate, non-quickened. Also, I get Remove Curse and Remove Disease. At this level, I'll be getting uh, my dual Night Forged Avenger Blades. These have a bonus 10% critical chance added to them. And I'll be using these straight up into level 20. At level 9, I'll be taking Improved 2-Weapon Fighting and Unyielding Sovereignty. For my skills, I'll be maxing out concentration and then putting all the rest into heal. I will be spending my enhancement points on coordinated strike, which is the falconary cleave attack, on expose weakness, which is a minus 50 fortification debuff to enemies when using the falconary attack against them, and then deadly instinct, which is a buff to my tactical DCs based off half of my Wisdom modifier that can re-chain charges when using the Falconary Cleave attack. Spells I'll be getting Bless to replace my Divine Favor and remove Paralyze. I'll be using the Deadly Instinct buff and then using the big Falconary Cleave attack against multiple enemies. The Deadly Instinct buff will assure me that my tactical DCs will be high enough. About the falconary attack, I would like you just to notice that it is huge. It's much bigger than regular cleave attacks. Also, you can see upon examination, bleed lasts for about a minute and it stacks, while the fortification debuff is very short, incentivizing you to continuously attack even if this is a single target. Unyielding Sovereignty is a massive heal and debuff remover, which most notably removes death penalty. We will be talking about it more later. Level 10 is Cleric. I'll be maxing out my concentration, my heal, and then putting all the rest into diplomacy. As a rule, for my Cleric levels, the order is always first concentration, then heal, and then diplomacy. And for my Monk levels, it's concentration, then jump, and then diplomacy. I'll be spending 3 points on No Mercy for additional 30% damage versus helpless targets, 
and at one point into Knife Juggler, which gives me the Feet Deflect Arrows. I'll be taking Cure Critical Wounds as my primary heal, making sure it's quickened, and Cure Serious Wounds as my secondary, non-quickened. Also, I'll be taking Death Ward and Freedom of Movement. Level 11 is Cleric. I'll be spending my points in Concentration, then Heal, and then Diplomacy. For my enhancements, I'll be taking 1 point to Heal, and 3 points to Concentration and Hit Points. I'll be taking for my spells, Restoration, and Remove Blindness. Level 12, Cleric. My ability point will be spent in Wisdom. I'll be auto-granted Greater Domain of War which adds a bonus to tactical feats equal to half of my cleric levels. I'll be taking improved critical slash that will add two to the critical threat range of my long swords. For my skills, I'll be taking the usual concentration, heal, and then maxing out diplomacy. I'll be spending my enhancements on smite tainted creature and jade strike. My spells will be protection from elements, Rise Dead, and Sound Burst. Smite Tainted Creature loses its power without a whole bunch of monk levels, and the part of turning monsters into Jade is only on a Vorpal, making it very unreliable, so we're gonna ignore it. Jade Strike, however, works on any critical hit, so the more critical chance you have, better chance of actually pulling off the Jade part of the Jade Strike. If you do, you will encase a monster in the Tomb of Jade. I will be using Sound Burst as if it was a cleave attack to target a whole bunch of monsters at once. Level 13 is Cleric. I'll be maxing out my Concentration, my Heal, and then my Diplomacy. For my Action Points, I'm going to take 1 Point of Wisdom, the Core Tier 2 of Shintao, and 5 more PRR. My spells are Stalwart Pact, and Panacea. Panacea removes basically every negative effect except for negative levels and remove curse. And upgrading protection from evil to magic circle against evil. Basically the same thing but AoE. Level 14 is Cleric. I'll be spending my points in Concentration, Heal, and then going all the rest into Diplomacy. For my enhancement points, I'll be taking 10 more points of PRR, 1 point of heal, and taking Restoring the Balance that will add Remove Curse to my triple positive finishing move. For spells, I finally get to take Heal. And also I'll be taking Hero's Feast. When Restoring the Balance is active, it is on my shortcut bar inactive, and when I do a triple positive finishing move, I will now be granted also Remove Curse. The Stalwart Pact spell makes it so that when you drop below 50% health, you will get a temporary bonus to hit points based on your level and a plus 2 luck bonus to saves and armor class. Hero's Feast is a pre-buff that you do before you rest. After you rest, it will proc and give you a bonus to immunity to fear and poison a bonus to your attack rolls, and some extra temporary hit points. So this is typically cast either right at a shrine before you shrine, or more likely just at the beginning of the quest with all the other buffs. Level 15 is Monk. Granted some upgrades to my auto-granted Monk feats. I will be taking greater two-weapon fighting. For my skills, I'll be maxing out concentration and then putting all the rest into jump. For my enhancements, I'll be taking one point of wisdom and Tomb of the Jade. Tomb of the Jade will encase your target in a Jade Tomb on any successful hit. So combining this together with Deadly Instinct to reassure that you have the tactical DCs for it, this becomes a very useful tool to neutralize a powerful target. Level 16, Monk. For my ability score, I'll be taking Wisdom. I will be auto-granted immunity to all natural diseases and also some extra armor class. For my skill points, I'll be maxing out Concentration, then Jump, 
and then whatever is left goes into diplomacy. For my enhancements, I'll be taking Dismissing Strike and two points into taking less damage while I'm helpless. Dismissing Strike is a key-based insta-kill for all outsiders. As long as the outsider fails its save, it will kill it in one shot. Assuming, of course, this is not some kind of red name or any monster with a death block. Level 17 is Cleric. For my skills, I'll be maxing out Concentration, then Heal, and then Diplomacy. For my enhancements, I'll be, I'll be spending one more point avoiding damage while being helpless, one more point in Heal, and then finally I get to take Rise of the Phoenix. My spells are Greater Dispel Magic, and spell resistance so now if you die you'll be able to once per rest with a 15 minute cooldown timer self-resurrect yourself to 50 percent health just by clicking on rise of the phoenix level 18 is cleric i'll be taking two-handed fighting for my skill points i'll be maxing out my concentration then heal and then diplomacy for my enhancements, I'll be taking Violence Begets Violence and starting to spend the rest of my points in the Human Racial Enhancement Tree. For my spells, I'll be taking Recitation, Greater Restoration, and Resurrection. I would like to point out that Recitation adds 2 to your Armor Bonus and to your Attack and Damage, while Prayer only adds to your Attack and Damage, but it adds more than the 2 of Recitation, so having both is useful. Violence begets violence will give you a buff every time an enemy misses you, as long as you are centered. This will add plus one to your critical threat range, and it can stack up to five times. Adding this to your already long critical threat range, this means you'll have a very good chance of landing the Jade part of Jade Strike. Level 19 is Cleric. I'll be taking Master of the Domain of War, and for my skills, I'll be getting, I'll be maxing out Concentration, then Heal, and then Diplomacy. If you open up your character sheet, you will see that you have a base 20% Strike Through. Now I can spend points in the Human Racial Tree on Great Weapon Aptitude. This will allow me to add a Strike Through chance with the prerequisite of having a two-handed fighting feat. Also, I'll be spending one point on Action Surge Wisdom. You can see now that my Strike Through Chance is 40%. The Action Surge means that every time I use an Action Boost, whichever it is, will add to my Wisdom now. For my spells, I'll be taking Ward of Recall, that I'll be using in combo together with my Evening Star key to get back from Evening Star. Finally, I'll be taking Summon Monster 7 just because I don't have anything else that I need. Opening up my character sheet, inside of Fates, under Cleric Domains, I will find a Master of the Domain of War. This is an SLA buff. This will add plus one to the critical multiplier, plus one to the critical threat range, and plus one to the enhancement of whatever weapon I'm using. This means that my Nightforge Avenger Blades, once buffed, are a 14 to 20 times 4 critical hit. And when fully stacked on Violence Beget Violence, it now becomes a 9 to 20 times 4 critical range. Level 20 is Cleric. My ability point went into Wisdom. For my skill points, I will first max out Concentration, then Heal. The last three points, I spend one whole rank and jump, not get a half a rank, and then the last point in Diplomacy. My last Heroic points will be spent on maxing out Action Surge Wisdom, and then some more Healing Amplification. If you have those points, the priorities are the Action Surge Wisdom, and the 20% to the strike through, then the healing amplification. My spells are True Sing, Death Pact, and Holy Aura. At level 20, I'll be getting my Oath Blade from the Purple Dragon Knight Trader. This has the same extended critical profile 
as the Nightforge Avenger Blade, just that now you can add a Saintine gem to it and your filigree. The main filigree set is a five piece prowess set. This makes it so that when you use any action boost, you will get a 10 second boost of 50 melee power. Once I'm a level 20, I'll be able to use my destiny points. So I'll be taking the Mantle of Fury for levels 21 and 22 to give me some fast healing. In Legendary Dreadnought, I'll be taking Dire Charge as my epic attack. I'll be taking Break Through the Line that will give me a plus 3 bonus to all of my ability scores anytime I use an action boost. This will stack together with the plus 3 to Wisdom I'm getting from the Human boost. Also, I'll take some extra action boost, the ability to add Ghost Touch to all of my weapons, and some more healing amplification. My 4 level 20 action points will be spent on even more healing amp and some hit points. At level 21, I'll be auto-granted Epic Defensive Fighting, and I'll be taking Overwhelming Critical. Overwhelming Critical adds plus 1 to your critical multiplier on hits of 19 and 20. Epic Defensive Fighting can be found in your Feats tab underneath Epic Feats. Drag it to your action bar and activate it. This will give you up to 25% total hit points. It will restrict your spellcasting though to touch distance while it's active. I'll be spending all of my action points in Exiled Angel's Subtle Flame to get another 5% positive spell power. This might seem like a waste, but there honestly isn't much better things to spend it on. At level 22, I'll be taking Perfect 2 Weapon Fighting. This will increase my offhand double strike from 50% of my base to 65% of my base. At level 23, I'll just be granted the standard epic feats. At level 23, I'll be unspending the points from Fury and putting them into Angelic Form, Deepening Faith, Endless Turning, and Holy Presence. Deepening Faith will make your Echoes of Power start recharging already when you hit just 30 spell points. No need to get down to 12. Endless Turning makes your Turning Melee Power buff now endless, and it adds restoration to it. The rest of my points I'll be spending on Momentum Swing that will add a trip to my Dire Charge. Note that this also goes off for your stun DCs. No need to get a trip item. From now on, I'll be using the Angelic Form as my epic stance. This means I'll auto-heal indefinitely every few seconds for a nice amount based on my positive spell power and healing amplification. Also, now that I can afford it, I'll be making Panacea as my secondary heal, since I'll always have enough to pay for it, since the base is 25. For my enhancements, I'll be adding plus 6 to confirming critical hits while in precision, and another plus 2 to attack and damage with all weapons. At level 24, I'll be taking Adept of Forms, this will update all of my Monk Elemental stats and also all of my Monk Elemental Strike attacks. Note, this is not necessary to upgrade these just for the combo. The combo is all the same, but the hit portion will be upgraded. Assuming you drag the new ones to your short bar bar. My ability point will be spent in Wisdom. I'll be spending my action points on Fury of the Wild Die Hard and some extra PRR. At level 25, I'll be taking Guardian Angel. This is a defensive feat that will proc when you drop below 50% hit points. It will give you a boost to PRR equal to your Wisdom and a boost to saves equal to your epic level. This is very powerful on a Wisdom-based character. Here I show how it looks when Guardian Angel is procced. Note that it lasts for a half a minute and it can only proc once every 3 minutes. Level 26, I'm only going to get the basic auto-granted epic feats. I'll be spending my action points on Untangible, that turns my action boost into a displacement boost for the same duration, and Carry On, that gives me a 10% action boost haste 
to any action boost. Note that this doesn't stack with a 30%, but it means that all of my action boosts, including the ones for melee and range power, now also give me 10% action boost speed attack. When I can, I'll be taking Lay Waste. Level 27, I'll be taking Master of Forms. This will further increase my benefit from the Monk Elemental Stance and the Monk Elemental Attacks. I'll be spending my points on some PRR, some Tactical DCs, increased saves, and increasing my Unconscious range. Don't forget to upgrade the Monk Elemental Attacks if you happen to actually use these for attacking. At level 28, I'll be taking plus one to my Wisdom Ability score and defeat Fount of Life. This will add 20 to my positive spell power and 20 to my healing amp. I think this was supposed to be called Fountain of Life. I'll be spending my action points on Cold Iron Damage Reduction and Primal Scream. Primal Scream has a 5 minute timer and 30 second cooldown. It can be used all the time and it gives you a plus 2 primal bonus to strength, dex, and con. At level 29, you're only going to be getting your auto-granted epic feats. I'll be spending one action point to increase my unconscious range and saving the last three for level 30. At level 30, I'll be taking Grand Master of Forms to fully upgrade my Monk Elemental Stance and Elemental Attacks. I'll also be taking Scion of the Astral Plane. This gives me plus four to my dodge and my tactical DCs. And actually, some of the abilities are doubled when you're centered. I'll be spending my points on Action Hero, Legendary Rally, and Lacerator. Lacerator will add a plus one critical multiplier on my hits of 19 and 20. Hero is the ultimate action boost. Basically, any action boost in the game is all included in this one 40 second action boost. It triggers everything that a regular action boost will trigger, and it does not share the timer with other action boosts. That means you can have action boosts who overlap. They don't stack, however. This will be recharged every three minutes. Legendary Rally is a big cleave attack, which is very powerful, and also negates some negative effects. Attacking. Here you can see a comparison between the left, where I'm just attacking without boosting or anything, and on the right, where I'm boosting up. And you can see the amount of damage I put is much, much higher. When it comes to a boss, don't forget to boost up. After all, even if he's immune to your special attacks, you can get rid of his fortification and overall speed up the amount of damage you deal to him. Strike through gives me a chance to hit multiple targets with a single hit. Since I have less than 200%, my first attack will always only hit one target. If I want to hit more than one target at a time, I have to start hitting with both weapons. That means allow the animation to start running. Since I have, from my human feats, I've added extra strike through, that means I'll be hitting many times more than one target. Here I've got a construct who is immune to critical damage. Now I have the ability to bypass some of his critical damage by armor piercing. But if I hit him with the falconary attack, that will reduce it by another 50. You'll see it like a debuff when you examine your target. This is a very important against tough bosses. You can see the DCs by hovering over the different attacks. If I click on that deadly instinct, it will add a big boost to the DCs of my special attacks while it lasts. This means that the special effects of these attacks have a much higher chance of landing. Using the falconary attack will reset your deadly instinct charges, technically making it possible to keep it up at all times. Healing. Most of your healing will be done automatically. You just stand and you will heal. And we're going to talk about now active healing. For your active healing, you can always have two heals. You can have your primary and your secondary. Your primary will always be the best possible heal you can cast and will be always quickened. Now you'll notice that you can't click it multiple times in a row since it has a cooldown. For that, we have a secondary heal. This heal will be able to be pressed while it's on the cooldown. 
The secondary heel also will always be inside of the range of your minimum spell point pool. By level 4, I can take Cure Critical or Panacea. Panacea is not as strong, but it removes also negative effects, making it better. If I would be a party healer, I will be just taking Mass Cure Critical and Mass Cure Serious. Since I'm a single healer, I'm using Heal and Panacea. Once I hit level 23, I'll be getting Deepening Faith, which increases my Echoes of Power to 30 spell points. So now my secondary spell can be anything under 30 spell points. So while at low levels I'll be using some other spell, anything under, under 12, and also of course making sure it's not quickened because it'll be too expensive. Once I hit level 23, I'll have the option to use Cure Critical or Panacea. As I said before, Panacea is better, and because of my spell point reductions, I can even use it with Quicken. So eventually I end up with Heal as my primary and Quickened, and Panacea as my secondary and Quickened. During the heroic levels, that is from 1 to 20, I'm using my Epic Fast Healing Feat. This is taking up my active Primal Pass Live Stance. This isn't critical for the build, I just don't have anything else. Resurrecting. One of the main factors of this build is being able to resurrect yourself. Here's the priority list. When you die, the first resurrection you're going to always use will be Rise of the Phoenix. This is the best one, and it brings you back to 50% health, and it doesn't require any special penalty to have it on when you're walking around with it. If you die for a second time, you will now use your Dagger of Jack Jibbers with a combo of Death Pact. That means you hit the Dagger, and right after that, you hit Death Pact. Since Death Pact has to be cast before you die, you won't be able to do it unless you set yourself up. However, it has a minus two constitution debuff. So you don't want to use it unless you know it's inevitable you're going to die. Like for instance, after you use your dagger. You will either die from the dagger robbing or for more damage. When the inevitable happens and you die after the dagger, you will now have the option to use the self-resurrection from Death Pact. Mind you, this only stays for a half a minute. Once you are resurrected yourself for the third time, this is when you use your unyielding sovereignty and get rid of all the negative levels from dying. A few notes about self-resurrection. Rise of the Phoenix is by, is by far the best and it even works underwater. Death Pact cannot be cast underwater, but it can be accepted while underwater. Cursed Blade of Jack Jibbers will not work underwater. You cannot use your Undying Sovereignty to get rid of your death penalties while you're under the effects of the Cursed Blade of Jack Jibbers. Since it gets rid of death penalties, but you're right now dead. Once you've used your abilities to self-resurrect, make sure to rest, as it will reset the charge of Rise of the Phoenix, and, and it will get rid of the Anti-Death Pact debuff that prevents you to casting it twice in a row. However, you will still have to wait for the timer to reset. Please note that when dying under the effect of Death Pact, you will be usually prompted with a window asking you if you want to self-resurrect. This only lasts for half a minute. If, however, you die from a trap or from a damage over time spell, regardless if that is single target or AoE, you will be automatically instantaneously resurrected without ever getting prompted if you want to. This is a double-edged sword, potentially being great 
or horrible. If, for instance, you're standing in the middle of a trap, you will be instantaneously revived and then immediately die again, completely wasting your death pack. However, if you don't instantaneously die again, you'll be skipping the death penalty and even the death timer that you would usually get in Reaper quests. Here I'm in Reaper. Here you'll see that I've been taking damage from environmental effect. This is the rotting debuff from the Jibber's Blade. And you'll see that I was killed by a misadventure, just like a trap. And if you watch closely the clip, you'll see that I go from Jack Jibber's death state straight into fully live, and I don't get an extra death penalty. Keep this in mind, you can use this strategy even in raids where you have a very long death timer. Gear. The Cursed Blade of Jack Jibbers comes from the legendary version of Tuto Tobias. This comes from the end chest. For your level 8 swords, you're going to have to go farm them out. First you go to House Deneth, pick up the quest, then you head out to House Kondrak. Over here we're going to step into the quest. The way to get there is pretty simple. Basically, we're going to step to the left and you skip the first door. In the second door, we have this long tunnel that has rooms coming off it, left and right. It's very symmetrical. You can go through each room and look for a chest. Make sure you're very careful you don't miss it. Where it spawns is random, so every time you run this instance, it'll be someplace else. Mind you, the difficulty setting does not matter for this, since the reward is always the same. Eventually you'll find a chest with a silver key. Now you're going to head back out. Once you get back out to the big chamber, again, you'll do just like before. You will skip the first door and go to the second one. This is where the locked door is with the silver key. From here, we're looking for adamantant ore on the floor. So be very careful. You can use select next. Basically, just stick to the left and just keep on going around. That way you won't miss anything. These little cubby holes have a lot of adamantium. The total amount that you're looking for is 15 ore. There isn't any more and there isn't any less. Uh, mind you, you're going to have to have some kind of throwing weapon or ranged weapon to get some of these barriers to go down. You can farm this in a previous life, but you're going to have to do it on the character. You're going to use it since the item itself is bound to character. The adamantin, however, is not bound to character or bound at all. You can actually buy it off the action house or farm it with a different character. The one who buys it though is gonna have to be the character who's about to play this game. Here you talk to the smith and I'm gonna buy the Knight Forged Avenger Blade. This has a baked in critical threat range of four instead of two. And this is what it looks like when you dual wield them. Make sure you get two. Each one costs 10, so you'll have to do it at least twice. The level 20 swords are the Oath Blade you get from the Purple Dragon Knight trading. The Purple Knight Dragon accommodations come from the Evening Star quests. They cost 15 apiece, and I strongly recommend you get two of them. These can accept sentience, and you'll be using them basically until the end of the game, until you trade out for your legendary weapon. Here's what the dual Oath Blades look like. What makes the Oath Blade special is its baked in critical threat range. Again, this is a baked in 17, 18, 19, 20, and with my improved critical slashing, it adds another plus two to a 15 to 20. Here you can see on the left how it looks when it's unbuffed, and on the right with my sentient gems and everything all put in. Note that since this is a very old item, I strongly recommend that you add the adamantium to ritual to it to make it tougher because it's going to drive you crazy and takes multiple times damage during quests and breaks. Once I add Holy Sword, the weapon now becomes a 14 to 20 times 4. An honorable mention is the Thunderforge weapons. You can either pick up a sword if you just want something who's metaline or a shuriken if you don't have anyone to throw, or perhaps even a pair of hand wraps, if you just want to fight oozes. This is easy and cheap, and I strongly recommend it. Here's the cosmetic look 
of the Thunderforge longsword. It has this black glowy shadow around it, which I think is pretty cool. At level 26, you have access to the Fell Blade. This is a raid item that comes from Defiler of the Just. If you happen to have a bunch of extra raid runes, feel free to buy this. This also has an extended critical threat range of 2, so 17, 18, 19, 20. This is extremely powerful. It has Sovereign Vocal on it, who kills everything under 3,000 hit points, improved banishing, and it has Armor Piercing 20, Double Strike 15, it's Cold Iron, and it has two slots. This is super powerful for its level. However, if you are already at level 30, I wouldn't recommend going back to farm it. You are better off with one of the new legendary weapons. We have the Time Blade from the end of the Chronoscope Raid. And we have the Sirocco from the Wizard King's End Chest. Both of these come as heroic weapons and you have to upgrade them in the Altar of Epic Rituals, then the Altar of Legendary Rituals. The Time Blade is the one on the right and the Sirocco is the purple one on the left. Both of these are the two legendary long swords of DDO. They're both brand new, so I'm giving you a small review of both of them. The legendary Time Blade is a raid weapon. This is technically the strongest of the two. It gives you legendary paralyzing and legendary slow burst. The DC save on both of these is 100, making it so it actually hits pretty consistently. The Sirocco has two effects. It has legendary telekinetic and legendary Sirocco, both who have a DC of 100, making it also land pretty consistently. Mind you that to upgrade these weapons, you'll need star fragments. They currently only come from Salt Marsh. The legendary Sirocco only needs sand ingredients and, and five fragments. While the legendary Time Blade will also require five legendary tokens of the 12 and Threads of Fate, making it way more expensive. You can use one of the weapons that comes from the five full sets. That is the two from Barovia, Salt Marsh, Sharn Docks, and Feywild. None of these are exceptionally great, but they can all be a good start. The legendary Amethyst Loop comes from the Haunting of Salt Marsh. It gives me my true seeing and blindness to immunity, improves deception, spot and surge 20, and it gives me 11 to my reflex save. I have slotted in Sapphire of Heroism because I don't have greater heroism, and Topaz of Quick Movement, just holding the place for my Draconic Soul Gem when I get it. This is one of my five piece legendary salt march set it gives me ultimately a plus three artifact bonus to all stats the legendary driftwood braces come from rest from the night in salt marsh this is the second part of my salt marsh set this gives me my insightful wisdom six it's got my healing lore and my devotion also some wizardry i've slotted in a topaz of death block and the essence of the epic litany of the dead who gives me plus two profane to all stats the legendary Marsh Reed Cloak comes from the Hijacked Hall. It gives me my plus 15 bonus to assassinate. And I've also slotted in a Sapphire of Stunning 14. Also, I put in a Diamond of Dexterity 12. This is really just my third piece of the legendary Salt Marsh Explorer set. My legendary Ethereal Ring comes from the Final Enemy. Three Invisibility Clickies. I've also added my Eldritch Ritual Resistance. It has Enhanced Ghostly, which is a 15% mischance that stacks with everything else. It gives me my Haste Bonus to attack and movement speed, and it gives me Dodge 13%. And it's slotted with Topaz of Water Breathing and Topaz of Feather Falling. This is the fourth part of my Legendary Salt Marsh set. My minor artifact is the Black Pearl Ring. This has 14 wisdom for the max. It also has negative energy absorption, 50 charges, and also a legendary nightmare guard who can instant kill things when they attack me. I have slotted in a plus two diamond of festive constitution and a plus two diamond of festive wisdom, and also my globe of true imperial blood. As my artifact, I have three pieces out of four 
Nihistol Magical Defense. This is because I'm trying to go for the four piece set to get an extra 100 hit points. I'm getting this from any chest in Salt Marsh, but most consistently, you have a chance one of six artifacts when completing the legendary saga. My armor is the legendary turncoat and it comes from a Sharn Welcome. It's got all the stats you need on it with the healing amp and false life. I slotted in a sapphire of natural armor. And this is one of my three piece legendary part of the family set. I got my gloves, the legendary hammer fist from Lone Deadline. This has my insightful double strike. It's got the Kenneth Cambit infusion who goes off and adds me plus four alchemical to strength, dex, and con. And it also got Seeker 13, plus another Insightful Deadly. And I've slotted in a Sapphire of Protection 10. And this is the second part of my legendary part of the family set. My necklace is the legendary family recruit sigil. And this comes from House of Pain. This has true seeing that is redundant, but it has 20 armor piercing to get past fortification. Got Deadly 10 and Relentless Fury that triggers every time I kill something. I have added a diamond of strength so I don't become encumbered with too much weight. This is the final part of the legendary part of the family set. My trinket is the five rings from the Slave Lord's crafting system. This is the legendary version and I've made it to fill out all the things I'm missing. So quality wisdom 3, 20 heal, 20 accuracy, constitution 13, and I've also made a slot and slotted it with my Diamond of Insightful Constitution 5. The legendary Pacific Circlet comes from the legendary version of Memories. And it's got my Potency, Insightful Potency, Quality Potency, and Magical Efficiency 10%. I've slotted in a Sapphire of Resistance. This item seriously boosts up all of my spell power and reduces the cost of my spells. The legendary mini pouched belt of the healer comes from the newcomers. It's got my quality devotion and my insightful devotion. The healing lore is redundant and also is the speed. And I've slotted a diamond of charisma just to give me a whole ton of my turn on dead charges. Boots of the mire come from the end of fathomed depths. I crafted these into legendary boots. These give me my quality constitution 3 gives me my sheltering which is MRR and PRR it's got balance 20 vitality 45 and underwater action who adds to my swim speed and my water breathing I've slotted in a diamond of festive dexterity and a diamond of insightful dexterity for low levels I'm using the quiver of alacrity upgraded in the fountain of necrotic might this comes from the Abbot Raid, or more likely, from the Anniversary event. That's where I got mine. Once I hit level 28, I switch over to the Epic Petrifying Quiver that will add blunted ammunition to my ranged attacks. Basically, it makes my Wimpy Shuriken now also deal bludgeoning damage. I have some crafted items that I use for the leveling process. I have a big set of belts they're all basically the same. They've got Death Block, Constitution, and False Life. Once I'm past level 10, they also have Insightful Constitution. And once I've made it to level 23, I have added in also a Diamond of Festive Constitution. I just use these for the leveling process. I put my Wisdom on a cloak, and I did it together with Natural Armor and Insightful Wisdom once I could. I have these for multiple different levels. So basically I just swap them out as I go. The gloves will be the best place for your adding devotion, healing amplification, and insightful devotion. You can do this again for multiple different levels. At low level, I just got a long sword that I crafted and I added bludgeoning and light damage to it. At low levels, the swords do not really matter. I have a Pharaoh Crystal Longsword from Feywild that I also use as my Ooze Beater. Again, you can get two of these if you want to fight oozes or just use hand wraps. I also got a Pharaoh Crystal Shuriken once I hit my Monk levels using 
A dagger will make you to become uncentered. At level one, I have my trusty throwing dagger. It's got a lined and middle line, and I would usually just use this until end game. But in this character, I need to change to a shuriken because once I have monk levels, I'll become uncentered if I use this dagger. Cosmetics. For my cosmetic, I'm using the epic red dragon plate. You will need to go get the shard of the red dragon that comes from the end chest of Vaughn 6. You'll need to get 20 red dragon scales that you can either get from red dragon chests or just buy off the auction house. Some Vaughn ingredients and five legendary raid tokens. Combining this, you'll be able to buy the epic red dragon plate. And then I made a cosmetic copy so I can wear it as an armor. My eyes are just the cosmetic that I bought from the DDL store. They're inside of cosmetic and pets, cosmetic gear, cosmetic headwear, and it's cosmetic glowing eyes infernal red. My cloak comes from the offshore account and it's the gossamer wave. And it has this cool fire effect to it. I made a copy of it and it has this cool transparent flaming look. I'm a big fan of cosmetic cloaks who allow you to see the armor through them. This has like this flaming look with these fiery edges to it. And it fits perfectly with this outfit. For my long swords, you'll have to get Enduring Conviction that comes from the Abitrade, the Heroic Abitrade. This is a very cool looking long sword, but not really worth anything else other than that. I only have one of them, as I only kept one, but I made it two cosmetic copies of it. Then I took these cosmetic copies and I added the flaming effect by adding a cosmetic weapon aura to the cosmetic copy. So here's my full look with both flaming huge long swords. Finally, I have an all in one image that you can screen capture and then print out to have it all in front of you if you're into that thing like me. I'd also like to make a special shout out to Strimtom who first helped me with tuning up this build. I have two more videos planned to go alongside this video guide. The first one will be the Phoenix build variations, where I'll be talking about all the different options for things you can change. For instance, different destinies, different feats, different races, classes, and how to even do it if you want to be a free-to-play character. Second video will be the Phoenix build wrap-up. So if I miss anything, make any terrible mistakes, or anything else that needs to go in, like comments, whatever, will all be in that video. Hopefully even a bit of behind the scenes. Anyways, that's it for this video. Hope you've enjoyed it. If you did, please hit like and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye.